finish us off for good. It will be a planet of apes. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of We'll Review It Our Shelves, the podcast where we review the movies on our shelves. Every two weeks we'll take a randomly selected movie from our collection and we'll review it ourselves. I'm Brian Morgan and joining me from the West Coast, fresh off of his Hawaii tour is... Dan Bergman, aloha. <laughs> How was Hawaii? It's still there. Well, that that is where we keep it, so I expect it to be there. Yeah, the 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 uh, the missile rumors were greatly exaggerated. It wasn't wiped well. off the face of the earth. <laughs> oh, oops, wrong button. <laughs> you know, funny side story on that. You know, my cousin was telling me about that event, uh, the uh, the false missile alert. Um, he said it was uh, quite a big panic. There were a lot of people, understandably, you know, a lot of people were concerned. But apparently, his wife is a boss because she just sat in the lawn chair and. Kind of had that attitude of, yeah, bring it. She was the, the beacon of calm in that chaos and everything. Was like, like, well, wow. what am I going to do about it now? A little <laughs> <Yeah>. late. <laughs> like we're on an island. Where are we going? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, go for a swim, maybe? <laughs> no. Although, it does bring to light the question. It's a nuclear bomb, I would suppose. So, I don't know that this would exactly work. But Mythbusters did do an episode where they busted the myth or proved the myth of if you jump into water during an explosion like they do in movies a lot that it will help you survive strangely enough it helps you survive yeah i was about to say it, it kind of makes sense if you have even a rudimentary understanding of physics uh, a, a blast shock wave and what yeah it's just changing between, the mediums and yeah yeah the, the difference between the density between water and everything now if you're in the water and there's an explosion in the water yeah you're screwed <laughs> that's an issue right yeah <laughs> so but, no, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, water is actually kind of an effective uh, shield. Uh, yeah, but I don't like I don't know that it would work for a nuclear blast, but, I mean, heading to the beach might be, you know, an answer. Maybe. If you can hold your breath for that long. <laughs> yeah, well, if you calculate how far away the explosion is and delay the time until the shockwave arrives, eh, maybe, you know, you never know. <laughs> yeah, just don't look at the blast and, you know, don't wait for the warm feeling on your back. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's jump into the conversation. Well, not really the conversation. Uh, episode 25, we're going to be talking about War for the Planet of the Apes. Uh, but first, we've got listener feedback from our episode 23, and it is from listener Jeff Edwards, one of our favorite listeners. Hi, Jeff. Hey. <laughs> And Jeff says, another episode of my favorite podcast. If you're a movie nerd and you're not listening to this, why the hell not? Uh, and I responded as myself, because I'm making it. <laughs> but uh, thanks again for the feedback, Jeff. And uh, we will continue trying to put out a reasonably decent podcast. And we don't have any feedback on our... Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves episode yet, but I'm sure we'll get some eventually. While we're on the subject of listener feedback, in order to give our listeners more of a buy-in, I suppose, on the movies that we talk about, we have implemented a new process, and basically what that involves, as noted on one of our Facebook posts, every episode with a 5 and a 0 in it, so episode 30, episode 35, 40, 45... Kind of reminds me of Schoolhouse Rock. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Stop. Oh, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> so every episode with a 5 or a 0 will be a listener-selected random episode. So if we only have one listener request, then we'll just do that one, and then we'll continue pressing the random magic movie button as we go along. But if we have multiple 
listener requests, we will push the random magic movie button in the listener section, and we will discuss one of the movies that listeners have provided. There are a couple of rules. We do have to own the movie, um, but suggest anything. It might be an impetus for one of us, at least, to go buy it. Um, I know, as we've pointed out in a couple of episodes, there are some movies that I will make reference to that I don't own, and then I think, why the hell don't I own that? Like during our Robin Hood Prince of Thieves episode, I spoke of Time Bandits, and then I realized I love that movie and I don't own it, and that makes me sad. So I'm going to have to fix that. But, again, that that just gives us a reason to go get the movie. We may have seen it, we may not have seen it, um, but it gives us a chance to talk about it. And if you take your telephonic device or one of your magic recording devices that you own, you can record some audio that we can play during the episode and get your thoughts and feelings on the movie as well. So it's kind of like you're participating with us. And we will provide you with the points of contact at the end of the episode, like we always do. And so we are on to War for the Planet of the Apes. I'm going to tell you, though, before we get really into the movie, I was tempted to watch Battle for the Planet of the Apes because that's a way trashier movie, and I thought it would be a lot of fun. (laughs) (laughs) That would have been a funny comedic... uh, It's like, I watched that one, and it's like, no, no, it's war. Really? Oh, war, battle, what's the difference? Um, There's a lot. (laughs) But as to how this movie got on my shelf... Um, it didn't. Amazon provided me with the quality HD streaming of it for the purposes of this episode. <laughs> Thank you once again to the streaming service of your choice. Yes. Once, once again, Amazon gets free advertisement from us. <laughs> yeah, eventually we're going to have to work out a partnership with, that, with them where we have a link and we can buy things. I know it's possible. I just haven't explored it too heavily yet. No, but... To go how this ended up on my shelf, I gotta say, this uh, film series has been one of the bigger, more pleasant surprises in my later years of my life. It was one of those things where, you know, you think, oh, they're remaking something and it's gonna really suck. And the Tim Burton version, his remake, although it had merits, I like it, I own it, it's one of my things that's like, hey, it's Tim Burton, you know? I I know it was critically panned, but I like it. It was aight. Admittedly, it's... Not something to brag about. This one, when it was announced and then it was coming out, I was kind of like, yeah, right. You know, it's like, there's, there's going to be another one that's going to suck and everything. But it ended up being incredibly good. Everything about it. And the homages that it plays to the old Planet of the Apes film series uh, was just like, ooh, I remember that. <gasps> I remember that too. I, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, it's, it's like, get all the build up and everything. So, you know, when it came to a head in this film, and it actually got Oscar nods. It did. Visual effects. Yeah. yeah and, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but it just became like, yeah, how, how could this not be on my shelf? So, you know, I'm a proud owner of the, all three of the movies. Well, not to get too deep into it, because you already said you own the other two movies of this trilogy. Mm-hmm. I don't own any of them. I have enjoyed them. I haven't seen Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I've only seen Rise and now war. And as far as the continuation of the trilogy, I wanted to see it. I just didn't. I saw Rise because I think it was on TV, and or I saw it on deployment or something. And then I was in, intrigued because I, like you, thought, ah, oh, God, another remake or whatever, another rehashing of an old movie. And I have a long-standing love of the 70s Planet of the Apes movies. When I was a kid, one of the most precious toys that I owned that was lost to me forever in a move, um, but I loved that thing, was a Planet of the Apes treehouse. You know, with the old Roddy McDowell apes, and they were action figures, not dolls, um, but they were, you know, the 12-inch apes, and it was a put-together treehouse that you could play with, and I loved that thing. And I was always fascinated by the Planet of the Apes movies until Battle for the Planet of the Apes. And even then, I still love that movie because Mm. it might be crap. It might be the worst of the special effects movies. It was still Planet of the Apes. So, you know, there's that nostalgia 
of your touching something that I remember from my childhood in the same way that people say, oh, you're going to ruin my childhood. Like, no, I still have the memories of watching the movies. Those are still good. I just don't want them to spoil the... The name. Yeah, to, to, to slander the, the name, you know, to, to, to tarnish it. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. And that's the thing. This is one of those things, you know, it's like to quote another movie. It's it's they say the sharpest blades are the ones that are most easily marred and nicked. And Planet of the Apes is definitely an example of one of those sharper blades. And it's it's a very polarizing movie, I got to say, in, in my opinion, because you have movie sci fi, whatever, you know, nerds like us who can appreciate the movie for what it is. And it's it was a great movie. You know, I mean, aside from the quote-unquote hokey concept of apes taking over the planet, you know, it was one of those movies that had great acting and a lot of social commentary, and it just, it was a great combination of, of the such and everything. It's a very beloved movie, and, but on the other hand, you have these people, again, who call it, uh, it's a hokey concept about talking monkeys, you know. It's a movie. I mean... Yeah, no. <laughs> I've never understood that argument. Like, there's talking monkeys. Like, dude, you just had a billion people go to the movies and see a guy with a laser sword. Or you just had millions of people go see, well, at the time, let's say Charles Bronson murdering with impunity, you know, like 67 people. Or uh, Steve McQueen, you know, driving at 120 miles an hour through city streets. Like, really? You you think this stuff actually happens? Yeah, but see, that's the thing. And this is just my take on it or anything. It's like, the naysayers are usually people, and this is the start. This isn't the, the, the actual inclusion, but this, the start of this is that they don't get it. And the reason why they don't get it, though, is because when they see a movie like Death Wish, and, and here's the sad thing, they just remade Death Wish with Bruce Willis, where he's like, the, you know, the badass vigilante, and I'm sorry to say, you know, with the and you know with the gun debates going on, and everyone with the with the idea that oh, you know, all you need is a gun and you can protect everything. Um, you know, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun and everything. So the thing is, the reason why it, it's one of those things that that people quote unquote get is because it's what they wish they could be. You know, action movies are sure. so popular because everybody wants to be the action hero. Everybody wants to be a badass. It's it's ego. Yeah, it's 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 like confirmation bias, only different. Well, you know, but yeah, you're yeah yeah you're on you're on the right track with that. When you got a movie like Planet of the Apes, where a human has to deal with the fact that he is not on top of the food chain, that he is being treated like an animal to uh, beings that we literally treat like animals. Well, that's because they're animals. <laughs> they don't get it. And they don't relate, and therefore they dismiss it outright without really looking at it and seeing the commentary. And you well, know, because a lot they of don't times, see the allegory, they don't see the metaphor, and that's fine. No, and and that's a, the, the most uncomfortable things that movies do. And this is where you you find this in a lot of the more unpopular movies is that people find have a very hard time of looking into a mirror and seeing that yeah, really, that's me, that's us. I think that there are a lot of people that just don't want to use their imagination not necessarily that they don't want to look in the mirror that the movie presents because they just don't like the concepts anyway they don't like science fiction it's not their bag because every movie tells a story that looks at the human condition i mean that's what storytelling is so if they want to see the human condition as presented by animated foxes or animated mermaids for example um, then that's their thing. If they want to mm -hmm. see Bruce Willis run around and extol vigilante justice and, and look at the repercussions of that and look at it in a way and go, hmm, it's a great idea. It looks great on paper, let's say, um, but in actual implementation, it's kind of messy and it sucks. I don't think a lot of people get that out of that, but there's also the part of going to see those movies like the new Death Wish, or, or whatever, that lets them act out those fantasies, knowing that they can't actually go do it. Well, yeah, again, I don't disagree with that. Cause that is that is part of the, the larger spectrum, is that you have those crowds that, that do that. 
but that that was just you know like I said that was my analysis of why you know this, these movies are so readily dismissed and why Planet of the Apes is is so polarizing in that sense because you know it's like most of the people I meet they either really love this movie and they treasure it I, I should say not this movie particular but this franchise sure and then there there are those that were just like it's stupid I don't think I've ever really met too many people who are kind of in the middle like man it's okay it's good sci-fi but I didn't like it you know whatever hmm, okay and, and that's anecdotal you know it's just my personal experience sure sure unless you <laughs> Unless you conduct a poll and compare that to a control group and get a statistical sampling done, um, yeah, we're we're this, not that we're not yeah. that big a nerd. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I would love to see the data, but I'm not going to do it myself because it's not that important to me. No, I will st- I will stick with my anecdotal stories. I will stick with that, and I will sit on the couch and watch this movie again. <laughs> yeah, instead of going out and doing the survey, I will just watch the movie again and go, "This is a good movie," but. One of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about about this movie is what you had alluded to a few moments ago is the rich use of allegory. And and I'm jumping to the end of the movie for just a minute. When Caesar is leading the apes to the promised land and they're tromping through the desert, I'm thinking, yeah, that's some Moses imagery right there. They already had their first commandment, ape does not kill ape. Yeah. Um, and someone had already <laughs> right. broken that in the previous movie. Yeah, uh, it's funny, you know, it's like along the, the lines of, you know, that, that apes make better humans than humans do. It's it's funny how that's their first commandment, that, you know, apes do not kill apes. And for us, it's like, what, our fifth or sixth commandment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's somewhere down the list. Yeah. Yeah, the first couple are don't have any false gods, don't, uh, no graven images. Yeah, on the um, Sabbath, and then on your yeah. father. Yeah, yeah. De- yeah. Depending on which version you're look of of the Bible that you're looking at, it yeah, it's, it rounds up about fifth or sixth place. <laughs> well, it made the top ten, so it's got that going for it. Yeah, <laughs> I bring you these fifteen, <laughs> ten commandments. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with Frank and Ernest? It's an old comic strip. Used to be in the newspapers. I the name yes. Uh, if you ask me, what a panel. Uh, talked about no i never read it but i know i know it varied one of the ones that i remember and and is topical to this conversation uh it was moses coming down and he's holding the ten commandments and he says the good news is i got him down to ten the bad news is adultery's still in (laughs) priorities man priorities but all right so (laughs) let's let's get back to the allegorical nature of this movie uh, yeah, there was a lot of what I could read into as a, a religious metaphor. Um, Caesar being, you know, like Moses, you know, trying to re- get his people released from Pharaoh uh, and leading them to the promised land. Uh, d- d- am I alone in that, or do you see it as well? It wasn't the first thing I thought of when I saw it, but then, yeah, as the more you, you know, upon second and third uh, viewing of the film yeah it's like yeah it's very very moses uh sacrificial kind, kind of a you know moses jesus hybrid because you know he spoiler he dies at the end um so it could be seen as like his his sacrifice uh, to save his people yeah and he dies from a from a wound in the side as well which is you know what killed jesus it was a spear in the side not necessarily the crucifixion bit yeah so uh yeah again yeah rich, rich with that the religious allegory I wonder if that was a turnoff for some people. Kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, the people that don't want to be smacked in the face with that. I mean, and I don't want to go too far down the religion, anti-religion rabbit hole. It's just I'm, I'm curious if some people saw that and said, "Whoa, you're cutting it a little too close." Uh, I think it was it was subtle enough because I'm I'm usually acutely sensitive to religious messages in movies and whether or not they try to sneak that stuff under the radar. I'm not saying I'm any like kind of Superman when it comes to that, but I, I didn't notice it at first. It took you know a couple of viewings before I was like, wow, there is some similarities and everything. So as far as being a, an absolute turnoff or at least that being the reason for being a turnoff, I, I don't think so. I think it was subtle enough to where it was like, okay, I get it, that's cool. You know, my personal opinion on religious stories is that, you know, they're neat little bits of fiction, too. Yeah, they're good stories. Yeah, people adhere to them, and they want to emulate some of them. It's okay, I get it. And 
for it to be imitated and paid homage to, not a problem. Yeah, and I think that's actually one of the things that I kind of wanted to say is that if you're turned off by it, then that's fine. But if you look at it as someone was inspired by that story to make this movie, then that's honorable. I mean, that's actually a thing, like you said, it's an homage to to mm-hmm. that story and to the characters that we'd already mentioned. I think that the story of vengeance is very Old Testament, and that's mm-hmm. what Caesar was doing in this movie when he was trying to go find the colonel. There was the self-sacrificing piece where he was willing to serve as a distraction so that his people could get away, and then he was betrayed by his own Judas, uh, Winter, the white ape. So, uh, again, there's there's a lot of rich allegory But those stories are not limited to just the Bible. There have been stories of people being betrayed for thousands of years before the Bible. Yeah, we've had discussions similar to that about character archetypes and Mm -hmm. story tropes that, you know, go way back to when, you know, humans started telling stories to begin with. Yeah, look at Beowulf. Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, there was a documentary... It was uh, called The God Who Wasn't There, and they talked about the character archetypes that the Bible had. And I think the character of Jesus fits, I think, seven out of the ten hero archetypes. The things he didn't do, he didn't marry a princess and he didn't slay a dragon. Although, metaphorically, people might say he did. Who knows? Okay, well, fair enough. But you get my point. He follows a character archetype. And yeah, that's, you know, it's if you're someone like me who isn't very religious, but I understand the draw of the hero story. I get it. And not to put a weird monetary point on it, we were talking about people wanting to see or not wanting to see this movie. Um, It did do $490 million in the box office. And it was nominated for an Oscar, as you had mentioned earlier. Actually, I think it was nominated for two, if I recall correctly. Uh, One was visual effects. I know that for sure. Um, But I know that, or, or rather, it's possible that it was also nominated for a musical score, or was it just critically acclaimed? Good question. Uh, actually, I guess it didn't make back all the money in the U.S. Yeah, it was a $150 million budget estimated. It only grossed $146.8 million in the U.S., but cumulative worldwide, $490 million. So, so it made the money back. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and it was only nominated for Best Achievement in Visual Effects, not the music. It was just... Uh, critically acclaimed for the music. I know I'd read that somewhere again while I was doing research for the episode. Speaking of the music, I liked the music. It had very primitive beats to it, a lot of timpani, a lot of heavy drums, uh, kettle drums, whatever you want to call them. And it evoked a lot of, I don't want to say animalistic feelings, but it was kind of kind of primal. It was kind of primitive, and I liked it. I, I don't, yeah, I don't... <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know how to respond to that, because it's like, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if I... I don't know if I, I share that exact sentiment. I mean, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, I think of all the, the great aspects of this movie, I think the music is the one I paid attention to the least. Um, sorry to say. Uh, well, you know, good music, though, the, a good soundtrack should just flow over you. It shouldn't really be something you're like, oh, well, that was jarring. Um, it should just flow naturally with the story, and I think it did. Um, I thought it was a great score. There was, like I said, some good primitive stuff, and it was a, a, a very good soundtrack. Yeah, and it's funny that, you know, you say that, yeah, a good soundtrack uh, is something that I don't necessarily focus on is a good thing. And I think that's the thing I was going to touch on when it's a uh, Oscar nod for uh, Best Visual Effects. And you know, I know some people are like, well, what, what, what visual effects or anything? And it's like, it, it's just... Um, at one point, did you think that you were watching CGI apes? You know, because I mean, I've said it um, lots of times for other things. If if you have, if you look at something, I was like, wow, that's some really good CGI. That's bad CGI. Yeah, because you're noticing that it's CGI. Yeah, and again, and even though I know in the back of my head that these apes are all CGI'd, uh, not once during the entire movie did I was like, wow, that's good CGI. I just watched the movie. Um. I'll be honest, there were a couple of points where maybe it was because I was on a streaming service and maybe it was because I didn't see it on the screen because there are some times when CGI just doesn't translate well to the smaller screen. Um, But there were a couple of times, and they were minor, nothing that threw me out of the movie or anything like that, where I was like, ooh, yeah, that's not the best CGI. 
I, like I said, I didn't notice. I, I mean, maybe the story was enough for me not to really pay attention too much. I wasn't too greatly distracted by anything that I could construe as bad CGI because it didn't bother me. It turns out, yeah, it's like, uh, I think it's only Oscar nod was best visual effect. Yeah, that's it. Which, you know, the other thing to touch on is that, and I think we discussed this way back in our episode uh, talking about Mad Max Fury Road. I'm really enjoying that sci-fi fantasy is getting more and more oscar nods the sad thing is it's getting more oscar nods in the visual effects categories not the mm. actual storytelling now mad max fury no. road yes well i know we haven't discussed it but go back what won best picture science of the lambs a horror movie yes lord of the rings return of the kings fantasy okay okay fair enough mad max fury road almost won you know it was nominated almost but it didn't <laughs> I can reach to this phone and punch your face. <laughs> uh, but but you, you get what I'm saying, though. They're getting. I, more... I do. I do. They're, they're... It is occurring more frequently, and I appreciate that as a fan of that genre of movies. Okay, and and I know you you are a big comic book fan, and I and I, I have to think I, I have to believe that somewhere deep down inside you. You're waiting for that moment when a comic book movie gets Best Picture. Uh, yeah. All right. I know there's already a little buzz going around. People saying, "Oh, it's got to, you know, at least get nominated Black Panther." Which I don't know if it's Best Picture material, but damn, it was a fantastic movie. Yeah, that's our little blurb for Black Panther, which is timely because that's yeah, it's been out for a month and it's made a billion dollars. I thought it was a great movie, and it'll be on my shelf, so eventually we'll be discussing it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Although, you know, on the flip side of that, too, and I guess uh, there's other social commentaries, and we, we kind of touched on it a couple episodes ago and everything, uh, uh, Wonder Woman got snubbed. Yeah, that was interesting, and I don't know why. There were a few things about the movie that I suppose you could say, meh. Like the villain at the end, when Ares comes out, that's a little cliche, almost. You're like, oh, you had a great movie going until the last five minutes, and then it was just a good movie. <laughs> that may have been it. Uh, I know Logan, if you saw that, mm -hmm. was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, and that was based on the Old Man Logan storyline in Marvel Comics. Very much adapted, but that's where the idea for that came from. It, but it was still nominated. It was still nominated for a, mm -hmm. a Best, you know, for one of the major categories that they talk about during the evening. So I think that this movie being nominated for Best Visual Effects is deserving. And the visual effects were phenomenal. Um, there was, just, like I said, a couple of points where the CGI looked a little CGI-y. And it, again, it could be because of the small screen versus the large screen. I, I think that, that might have been it. Like I said, I, I watched it on a small screen. And I, I like I said, I didn't have any of those moments where I was like, oh, the CGI. Maybe it was the story was enough to overpower whatever subtle... Uh, shortcomings it had okay fair enough but uh i, I and that's the thing I, I i had thought or maybe it was just a buzz and it just didn't come to fruition but i, I thought that andy circus who plays caesar in this movie got a got an oscar nod uh for his acting in this which would have been interesting you know he is acting yes it's just he's beneath a mask of a cgi 8 but that is his acting because Again, I, I heard the arguments as like, well, that's not him. It's a, it's a, it's a computer. No, no, no. It, it, it is. It, it's, it's no different than if he's wearing face paint. Yeah, exactly. That's still his acting. It's and very much like Roddy McDowell in the original Planet of the Apes. They were still acting. It's a testament to an actor's emotional range when they can act through the prosthetics. And I will use one of my favorite television shows as an example. If you're familiar with Babylon 5... Familiar, yeah. Andreas Katsoulis plays a character called Jakar, and he is an alien, and he is an amphibious alien. Got a bald head, you know, great big prosthetics, and on his cheeks, and on his chin, on his head, and about the only thing that you can really see are his lips and his eyes, and even his eyes, he's got contacts, and... He's got uh, scales, or not quite scales, but, I mean, he's just, you know, everything is colored. His entire face is colored. And yet there are moments in that show where he acts through the makeup so well that it doesn't even matter. It's like, that's just raw emotion. So when Andy Serkis, who is one of the premier motion capture actors, can emote through the CGI, because those are points on the face that are tracked, 
and you can, you know, the, the motions are his. They're just mapped to an ape face. So when Caesar is acting angry and you see the cheekbones draw down just a little bit and that stern look wash over his face, that's Andy Circus, and it's just map points on his face to the ape. So yeah, they have to do some stuff, but you know, if you can't pull off the facial moment movement rather, then you're not doing it justice. In fact, you have to be, I think, a little bit better at that sort of thing for the motion capture to well capture it. Oh, I, I agreed. You know, and I'm looking at list of awards and nominations received by Andy Serkis. Uh, he's got quite the uh, resume here, a lot for his work on the Planet of the Apes franchise. Uh, best actor, best supporting actor for, you know, he's won a few Empire Awards. I don't know if I've even heard of that, but he's won uh, for best actor nominated Plan uh, Rise and War of the Planet of the Apes. Also for his work on Lord of the Rings as Gollum. So, yeah, I mean. Yeah, he was Supreme Leader Snoke as well. Yeah, unfortunately no awards for that. <laughs> And also, Andy Serkis was in the movie we were just talking about, Black, Black Panther, Panther, as Ulysses S. Claw. Yeah, no makeup, <laughs> or rather, minimal no makeup. makeup. <laughs> well, minimal. Yeah, he had the, yeah. the arm gun prosthetic thing or, or special effect. I'm sure that was just CGI. But he is in a lot of movies and a lot of mostly motion capture. Um, very rarely does he actually come out from behind the capturing. If you will, yeah. Uh, if uh, memory serves, he was also uh, you know Godzilla, yeah, in the in the 2014 remake. And didn't he? Um, I don't have the screen up just yet. Uh, but uh, didn't he also do uh, Kong Skull Island? Wasn't? He? Yeah, no, he was not in Kong Skull Island. Uh, I, I happened to look. Okay. All right, but yeah, he did do Godzilla and a number of other motion capture or anything. So he's the man when it comes to that. I'll tell you that. Yeah, he is. Like I said, the premier motion capture actor. He is, as they say, a good get. He also does the voices of the characters as well. I saw an interview with him on TV, or it might have been one of the bonus features on, I think, Lord of the Rings or something like that. But, you know, he, he, he was looking for his, his precious. He's, he's done that on a number of talk shows as well. You know, it makes the crowd go nuts when he does his golem. <laughs> yeah, all the fans lose their mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he did a great job in this movie because I was actually trying to find out i went and looked it up uh, to see if he was doing the voice of caesar and and he was uh, which shouldn't have surprised me but sometimes they'll use you know a different voice just because they don't know that the actors or the motion capture actor's voice is right for the role but he does great voices i mean he really did capture the right voice for caesar again going back to Gollum, i, I mean how many people haven't looked for their precious what is it got in its pockets um, you know, who hasn't done that? Okay, I'm sure there are a lot of people that haven't <laughs> done that. Say. But most of the people I know, anecdotally, <laughs> and if we talk to just the people I know, they have all, the entire planet's done it. <laughs> Some with or without an accent. <laughs> but yeah, no, I love Andy Serkis. I think he's awesome. No, yeah, see, I was going to say, Caesar, to compare beloved genres, uh, Caesar is no Darth Vader. You know, It's like the actor, every his voice, everything is Andy Serkis. It's not, it's not yes, one, one yes. guy for the voice, one guy for the body. <laughs> Apparently the audio tracks from the live performances, if you will, David Prowse has a very thick Scottish accent. It's like, there's no way but a master of evil ye be. Wait, no, that would be Obi-Wan Kenobi, but that's beside the point. I like find ye lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I am your father. <laughs> but again I'm, I'm impressed by andy circus i think he's great in this movie but i'll tell you who really impressed me even more is woody harrelson yes growing up in the 80s and watching him on cheers and then seeing him in white men can't jump and the money train both me like yay he was in a movie he is experiencing something of a resurgence in this last 10 years or so, just showing up in movies as a normal-looking character that's doing extreme things, I suppose, is, is the right way to put that. Uh, I mean, he was in The Hunger Games. He's in this. And I say normal-looking guy because Woody Harrelson is not what one would call a heartthrob. 
No, I believe the term that people use, he doesn't have, quote unquote, traditionally good looks is what people it's, oh, it's a euphemism for saying, you know, he's not a heartthrob or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I always thought he was a good looking guy myself, but that's just, you know, the non-gay male assessment of it. No, um, I'm going to say, though, in this movie, he was uh, he was downright scary, you know, without really having to change his look that much. I mean, just his acting ability and portraying the character that he was in this movie kind of really came out as scary looking to me. <laughs> yeah, he does controlled anger really well, which is what I think the colonel was doing is that restrained, like, I actually want to just kill each and every one of you, but I realize I have to keep you around to build this wall and do this thing. He was very controlling of his own emotions in that, and, and I think Woody Harrelson conveyed that really well. Yeah, uh, especially uh, one of my favorite scenes in this whole movie, though, is when he had Caesar as a prisoner, and Caesar's telling him everything that he has assessed based on what he's seen. You know, you're killing your own people, this wall is not meant for us, all these things mm-hmm. and everything. And just that, that whole conversation, he's just like, you know, that quiet listening, like, go on. And the, the genuine, like, wow, you are impressive. You you figured this all out on your own. And, and I like that, you know, he was a good enemy because he didn't just outright underestimate Caesar as just being a big dumb ape. He saw him as a, a genuine threat because he was so intelligent. Yeah, I agree. And that whole scene of that revelation that, yeah, it's like, wow, okay, yeah, you are a worthy opponent. That was a great scene. A lot of tension, a lot of of admiration for both their acting abilities. And one of the things that he didn't do in this movie, or at least I didn't think so, was what, again, the trope of the antagonist monologuing. Woody Harrelson did not monologue in this movie. He stated his point. He said, oh, yeah, like you said, you figured this out. Okay, well, there we go then. He let Caesar explain the issue to us as the audience. And then he said, yeah, look at that. You figured it out. Good on you. But it was never a matter of him going off on some long-winded speech about how apes needed to all die and how, you know, humanity had to restore itself and I am the chosen one that will lead humanity through the path of righteousness or whatever. Once it was revealed that he was actually the rogue element of humanity that was doing this thing, that's when I think yet another metaphor was put into place of the people that will oppress a group of people tend to be, at least now in our society, a minority, a small outcropping of the norm. Which isn't to say that that's not bad. It is. But I think framing it that way you can see there were a lot of them and i tried to do the numbers it was kind of one of those like well there's what a thousand of them i mean is that all the people that are left and then they sort of revealed that you know obviously no there weren't there were more troops coming or whatnot obviously there had to be a much larger force but i did the quick count of the people in the column and said okay there's five so i'm thinking there's at least a hundred deep so there were about 500 humans in this belief system Because otherwise they'd have left, right? I mean, there's no reason for them to stay if they don't believe in what the colonel is trying to do. Mm -hmm. But how much of humanity is left? And and if there are people coming in to destroy the colonel and his little rogue element, then what does the rest of humanity believe or think? I think that raises an interesting uh, discussion point about the nature of what this film tries to address. And what is that? Is that one... There are always people that will try to oppress and enslave, figuratively or literally, people that they feel are inferior or that they feel they need to control in the first place. Two, they are a smaller subset of the whole and should not be taken as representative of the rest. Uh, Three, that they needed a bad guy. (laughs) (laughs) I ran out of well, numbers, sorry. Well, to go backwards or anything, to, uh, you're more, it's like they, they needed a bad guy. Well, I think in this franchise, like pretty much almost any human could fill that role. And I think Woody Harrelson said it in that conversation. That was my favorite scene. And it's like, don't think that you're going to find an ally there. They hate you more than they hate me. So anybody, anybody could have been a bad guy in this film, any human. And I agree to a point, but we never saw that. We didn't. And again, it's like, that's just the storyline that the movie followed. Personally, I'm glad they went with this one because, like I said, Woody Harrelson was a great villain and he was downright scary. At least he was to me. And I guess, you know, having seen that level of fanaticism, not necessarily in person, but, you know, in current events. Sure. You know, um, it's real. No, I agree. I agree. I'm not denying that. Not even remotely. There are people out there and everything. 
So as to answer your middle question, you know, it's like, will there always be that not necessarily representative of humanity? Um, I, I, you know, I beg to differ on that. You know, it's like, I, I don't know that there will always be someone like that. I mean, there may be pockets of human existence where that didn't exist until one was born. And then, you know, it's like, oh, well, they've always been this way. I don't know that for a fact. I just, I like to think that there are short periods of peace and prosperity where they don't have a need to exist. And if they do exist, they just exist in the minds of people who are just going to shut up because, hey, you know, things are good. I don't need to hate on this person too much. It's just when things go bad, do they flourish? That's what we learned in history class is why there was such a ripe time in the 30s for dictators because things were so bad. Right, because the Great Depression didn't just affect the United States, it was global. It was global, and that's fertile ground for people like that. So if they exist, and they generally keep quiet during times of prosperity, then, you know, it's not harsh times. Like what is portrayed in Planet of the Apes is where, you know, they will flourish. And they, yeah, they that's will... the harshest of times. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, certainly the worst of times. Yeah, when 90% of the human race is eliminated, if you will, is killed by disease. So while we're talking about the disease aspect, rolling on to that next piece, and I liked what they did in this movie to transition to the 1970s Planet of the Apes, where men were primitive. They said the virus mutated, and suddenly they were mute and primitive. Mm -hmm. Because in the 70s version, they were and people kept saying, well, how did they get from here to here? Well, there you go. There's your answer. Yeah. Just like you talked about before. That was an exciting revelation when, you know, it's like, again, mute, and it's because of the disease. I'm like, oh, you know, again, that's the sci-fi geek in me going, oh, I get it. Oh, that's so <laughs> cool. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's a, that's such a huge thing because, I, you know, YouTube, I'm a big YouTube watcher. So many videos that nitpick continuity errors and some of them are valid sometimes they have a, a point and it's like oh that's a big plot hole i get it and everything and some of them are very nitpicky like you know on facebook there was one that talked about oh big glaring mistake in marvel movies and i'm like okay what are they and then one of them was like in this scene tony stark shirt is buttoned but then he turns around and it's unbuttoned yeah I again we care. talked about this before <laughs> i don't care I, when i was researching this movie there were a couple of points of note in the IMDb page that said, oh, there's one point where Woody Harrelson has an apple on a knife, and he takes a bite, and he puts it down, and then it's not there the next time. So what? I mean, did it did it throw you out of the movie? Like, oh my god, I can't, I have to leave now. In the middle of the movie, the apple's gone. I, I, I just, I'm so fixated on apples. Again, these are not important details. No. It's just somebody, you know, wanted to make themselves feel good about pointing this out in a movie. Yeah, the, the nitpickiness sometimes. You want to feel important, and it's like, look what I found. Good for you. You, you get you get the golf clap. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mo moving along, moving along. But on a continuity sense, there were also some points in there that refer to the Beneath the Planet of the Apes movie, which, again, goes back to the 70s franchise. Uh, there were some references to that that sort of closed those loops, if you will. And it was basically the quotes, the only good ape is a dead ape, that sort of thing. Um, those were in the Beneath the Planet of the Apes movies. There was the reference to Nova, the little girl character. Mm -hmm. And she was in the first Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Actually, not even the 70s. It was 1968 when that came out. Yeah, there was some discussion about that. Is there whether or not that she's going to actually grow up to be the Nova that bridges um, the astronauts? Because in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, there was a newspaper clipping that was shown on camera that said that a space mission and three astronauts were missing and that mm -hmm. was that was the exciting thing uh, the first movie uh, was like oh yeah they're they're totally coming back to the same yeah. place yeah. yeah doing doing the continuity with with the old movie and everything like that but they never mentioned it in in, either, in the next two subsequent movies so it's it's always no, they good. only made references to it or references that would tie into those movies. Yeah, and that's the thing, though. It's like, that was the thing that they mentioned once in the first movie. They never mentioned it again in the other movies, but it's still in the back of our minds and everything. And so that's why, like, after this movie, I'm just wondering if there's going to be, you know, another storyline sans Caesar where the astronauts show up and there's uh, that whole storyline and everything. And like I said, the discussion was going to be if Nova in this movie is going to be the Nova in that movie, or is she going to be a descendant? Um, Some of the research that I did beforehand, well, actually, most of the research is inconclusive. It just says there's a character named Nova in this one, there's a character named Nova in that one. 
Yeah, at this point, it's all speculation, and, you know, we just hope the writers do it well. Yeah, by the same token, there's a character named Cornelius, and it's a character named Cornelius in in the original movies, so it's there, it's not there. Whether or not they're the same characters or descendants of, maybe if the script writers or the storytellers say, they're the same people. You know, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know. My thing is, like, my hopes for a subsequent movie is that this band of apes, because, it, you know, the introduction of Bad Ape, the ape that they found mm-hmm. who, who escaped from a zoo, yeah. and they thought, oh, there are other apes like us? Because, again, you, you were talking about how we thought that Woody Harrelson's band was the last of humanity. We found out they were not. And right now the apes think that right. they were the only band of intelligent apes, and we come to get a hint that they are not. So my hope, and this is this is like, you know, fan theory, whatever you want to call it and everything, but my hope is that I want to see a story where this band of apes are living in relative peace and harmony with humans because of the relationship between Cornelius and Nova. You know, they know each other, not necessarily a quote-unquote relationship, but, you know, they know each other, they grew up together and everything, and when the astronauts show up, there's a conflict now because there's another band of apes that don't necessarily have the same relationship with humans, and there's a catalyst, there's a conflict, I kind of want to see that, where it's just like, okay, yeah, these groups don't necessarily hate humans, these do. That's that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see that that kind of dichotomy played out. Yeah, I think that would be pretty cool. It's a good storyline to explore as well, because as the apes evolve, do they evolve along the same sort of path that we as humans did to develop dissimilar cultures and to do different things, value different objects and ideas and Mm-hmm. you know, and, and land masses. I mean, just for, for that sake, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's a, an interesting story or at least an interesting place to go with the story. Like I said, that, that's what I hope to see. Whether or not we do get to see that, you know, time will tell. Yeah. I, I'm excited. I, I want to see more, you know, because sometimes people say, all right, three's enough. You don't need to ruin it and everything. And it's like, I don't know. I've, I've seen it where they've gone beyond. Like Marvel being the prime example, 18 movies later, and they're still all pretty good. So it can be done, you know. <laughs> Certainly. One of the things that I would like to see them evolve into, or the apes, um, if they're going to develop a militaristic society, one of the things that I would like to see them do is improve their watch standing abilities. Because one of the things that constantly drove me nuts was the apes just walking through an open field right at the wall at the entrance to the military facility, and nobody sees them. They're out in an open field. It'd be like some guy scampering across the DMZ in, in between North Korea and South Korea, and no one saw him. Really? You guys suck as watchstanders. <laughs> the entire group of apes disappear, and no one sounds the alarm. No one was standing watch over the apes in case they got a little worked up, got a little uh, excited. That was that was nothing. <laughs> it's it's um, I, I forgot the term that somebody used. You know, it's, it's like the... Um... I think it was like the Assassin's Creed syndrome or something that somebody alluded to. It's like, yeah, because they got all these apes escaping on a tight wire, and nobody bothered to look up. Well, that part I can kind of get, because <laughs> most people tend to look down for their threats, and they don't think about the up. So that one I can kind of buy. Uh, what bothered me was, you know, your entire freaking pen of apes disappears, and nobody noticed. Nobody. It's but, a plot point. Yep. I just want our listeners to know that we had to interrupt our recording, so if this seems like an awkward segue, it's because we took a two-hour break. Actually, I think three hours to go take care of some personal things and uh, go to some familial-type events. Uh, We appreciate your patience if we go over some things that we may have gone over before. Uh, We did listen beforehand to try and catch ourselves up to where we were but again we might cover something we've already covered and we just wanted you guys to know that and girls not to be gender specific (laughs) before the break we had discussed as i mentioned earlier the lack of watch standing by the highly trained professional military force and how much that vexed me so yeah Uh, i think i'd covered everything that i wanted to did you have anything to say about that you know the break actually gave me the chance to put some more thought into that and what i came up with was this is a post-apocalyptic world 
and these are some pretty bad fanatics. Uh, I thought that was kind of a good mixture there that uh, brought a lot of complacency. So maybe that's why they were able to sneak out and not have be noticed is that these soldiers are just like, we've gone through all this. What's the worst that can happen? And we're on our top of our game. You know, we're the badasses. We've got superior firepower. So thin, granted, but hey. Very thin. Yeah, anorexic, but... Uh, <laughs> a lethal weapon reference yes that, we're doing that, that was a, the, thank you so much for <laughs> you're gonna bust dixie <laughs> wow okay let's get back on track <laughs> amazifying <laughs> yes it is a testament to our laundry list of movies that we've watched and remember that we can do that but i completely disagree with your thesis your theory your idea regarding complacency i think it was just crappy planning on their part or rather crappy execution by the movie makers to say well why would they stand watch that's just silly it bothered me so much it just boil it down to just it's a plot point they needed the apes to escape so therefore everyone's like hmm, what's this you know <laughs> Ooh, look a penny you know oh, look at that look my shoes untied <laughs> What can I do with this penny? Do we still use money? What are we doing? <laughs> and again, the, the, the reason that it bothered me so much is, again, going back to our time in the Navy and mine specifically, I was on numerous force protection training teams, which involved training watch standers on how to stand a proper watch. And the fact that this special forces military unit that had rebelled or was had gone rogue or whatever was not standing by their previous military training just bothered the hell out of me yeah that's just kind of one of those things though where it's like we're you know we're military vets and we know what's what we've walked the walk the average moviegoer just sees a character who just doesn't see the apes escaping and that's all they need the monkeys had better watch standing than they did apes that's very offensive <laughs> oh okay i'm sorry <laughs> monkeys are lower on the evolutionary jade just <laughs> above humans <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the intelligent, upright walking apes will come to my house and advise me of my incorrect statement. <laughs> when they show up, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. So, enough. enough. Oh, hell. <laughs> All right, enough about the watch standing. Enough let's, about the watch standing. I think, I think we've beat that to death. <laughs> uh, speaking of horses being beaten to death, uh, the only other chief complaint I have about this, and actually I guess all of the apes movies in, in the franchise, is I get chimpanzees riding on a horse, because chimpanzees are not that big. Uh, what I don't understand is a full-grown mountain gorilla riding on a horse. A full-grown mountain gorilla probably weighs about 800 pounds or so. I didn't go Googling average weights of gorillas, but it's pretty big. They're not tiny. They're not spider monkeys. You know, they're not chimpanzees. They're freaking gorillas. And yet, these horses are riding at a full gallop and don't seem to have the slightest issue carrying six, seven, eight hundred pounds of ape meat, monkey meat, on a stick. <laughs> Uh, again, I, I got nothing, man. It's a movie plot point. They need to ride horses, so they ride horses. <laughs> um, I, I'm not saying that your observation does not have merit. I'm just saying, okay, fair enough. Plot point. Oof. Oh, I rolled with it. It, it didn't. It didn't <laughs> kill the movie for me. It was still a good movie. It's not like the apes just suddenly sprouted wings and called it the simian flu. Had a really weird uh, side effect on them. That would have been cool. That would have been cool. But again, it'd be like, oh, really? Maybe that's the next evolution. <laughs> when apes fly oh dear <laughs> fly my pretties fly <laughs> and then they go to Oz it'd be great what have we done <laughs> <laughs> maybe this break wasn't such a good thing <laughs> no but those are my two chief complaints about this movie other than that um, I thought it was very well executed and a couple of minor CGI moments again on the, on the streaming side but yeah i like the motion capture it's awesome and i like the music and i thought woody harrelson did a great job hail caesar yeah i want to just call out this no there's no really good segue to this but i just want to kind of want to call out the character maurice he was the orangutan he's been in all three movies orangutan 
Yeah, uh, originally he was a circus orangutan who wasn't special yet. He hadn't um, been made more intelligent yet when he first met Caesar. But because he was a circus ape, he knew sign language, so he knew how to communicate. So Caesar found a friend when he was locked away. To me, he's been an endearing character. Uh, my favorite moment with him was in the second movie when they the uh, Caesar was quote unquote assassinated by the rogue ape, and uh, Maurice turned to the humans and just looked at them. And Maurice primarily speaks in sign language, but he voiced out he was vocal in this one scene when he turned to him and just said, "Run." I thought that was a great scene, you know, because it's like, yeah, no sign language, just run. Yeah, the sign language thing was neat. I cared for that a great deal. Yeah, uh, and you know, the cool thing about it is that, you know, as I mentioned to you, I'm I'm learning sign language, and I'm teaching it to my daughter, and it was kind of neat to watch this movie and actually understand a lot of their signs that they were using. I'm like, oh yeah, I get that. I don't need the subtitles, you know? <laughs> so that was cool. That was kind of cool. But the reason I'm I'm bringing him up is that it, I thought it was kind of neat, the two two aspects, is that Maurice is acted out by a woman, Karen, excuse me if I butcher her name, Conoval. Uh, I did not, uh, yeah, yeah, I did not know that. that uh, right. I, I thought that was pretty awesome, that, that she is uh, brought him to life, and that his name is also a homage to the actor who played Dr. Zayas. I love you, Dr. Zayas. Sorry. Uh, Mar uh, his name was Maurice Evans. I think that they, they said in the special features that uh, they named that character Maurice as being the, the smartest orangutan in the group and Dr. Zayas being the orangutan. Yeah, very cool. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. So that was just a little aspect that I wanted to point out. Yeah, there were a lot of the apes that were portrayed by women. Well, actually, that one was the one that shocked me. I, I would have expected... You know, male ape, male actor. I don't know why. I, I, I guess it doesn't really matter when you're doing the the motion capture, but the voice sort of matters. Well, like I said, you know, Maurice doesn't really vocalize. Right, right. Occasionally we'll say something, but not, like you said, the run thing. Yeah, I think that's cool that they named the ape Maurice. And I was also shocked to learn that a number of the other apes were played by women as well. Um... Uh, and again, for motion capture, it doesn't really matter. It's just a, a body. It's when you get to the voice. And since Maurice didn't vocalize significantly, it's a neat factoid. You know, the funny thing is, uh, on this cast, just speaking of the cast, there were only two people that I really knew the actors, and that was Andy Serkis and Woody Harrelson. Everyone else after that, I would never really heard of them. There was no one that I'd heard, seen or heard of before. Yeah, a lot of uh, unfamiliar names uh, on this cast. and I guess that's a good thing, you know? I always, I always like uh, movies where the cast isn't very well known. Because, you know, when you, when you get a certain actor to star in a movie that is already part of a beloved genre, you know, you kind of have expectations. Right. And I, I don't want to say it ruins things, but, I mean, it, it's kind of that, that effect when all these well-known actors uh, showed up in the Star Wars prequels. Because, you know, aside from Harrison Ford, and even then, not as much as now, you know, when, when Star Wars first came out, all of them relative unknown actors. Yeah, they were a bunch of nobodies. A bunch of nobodies who, who became legends. Yeah, Harrison Ford <laughs> had been in American Graffiti. That was his biggest role to date, I think. And even that wasn't that big of a role. I mean, from, from like, screen time. And to go yeah. into Star Wars, that was... That made them, and they were forever tied to those characters. I think Harrison Ford has done a pretty decent job of being not just Han Solo. Uh, I mean, he's also Indiana Jones, so, you know, he, he got that too. I mean, Mark Hamill, he went into voice work predominantly, and he does a few other things. I mean, he was in the 1988 CBS Flash television series that lasted for all of one season. And barely that. I think they'd already made the episodes, so they just sort of left it there. And then he reprised that same role in the CW version of The Flash. And of late, he's been doing a few more things where it's him out in front of the camera as opposed to you know, in a studio doing voice work or whatnot. So that's pretty cool. But to support or to go along with what you were saying, 
when you see Bruce Willis being cast in a movie, you expect that movie to have Bruce Willis doing the things that Bruce Willis does. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis-y things. You know? Exactly. It's... Yeah, because yeah. and that's the thing, you know. It's like when I heard Samuel L. Jackson was going to be a Jedi Master, it was just like, really, Jules from Pulp Fiction? Wow, okay, <laughs> see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. What does Jabba the Hutt look like? Does he look like a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go in there and grab my lightsaber. <laughs> You'll know the one. <laughs> you know. <the> one. <laughs> and, and and that's why it's kind of cool when actors take breaks too, like. John Travolta did for a good long time. He had his moment in the sun, and then he just sort of went quiet for a good long time and then came back with a slew of movies. You're like, oh, hey, look, it's John Travolta doing stuff. Mm-hmm. And he was in stuff. I mean, you could look at his filmography on IMDb and go, yeah, okay, he was doing movies and he was producing or you know whatever kind of activities he was doing, but nothing that was a big multi-million dollar high budget or at least highly advertised movie you know he was just doing some some little stuff keeping himself busy yeah. well he had he had to meet somebody like quentin tarantino to get his career skyrocketing again yeah it's the right actor in the right place at the right time yeah with the right director you know then boom all of a sudden everybody wants him you know because they look what, look what tarantino did yeah exactly exactly because after pulp fiction then he did michael um and then he did Hmm. Face off. He did Phenomenon, Arrow. which I loved. Broken Arrow. Me. I, I don't own Me. that. I do own Phenomenon, so eventually we'll be talking about that at some point. Yay. But it's kind of like Woody Harrelson. He was very quiet for a good long time, and and he did stuff. I mean, he was in some. I don't want to say cult classics, but he was in some very specific genre movies. He was in what was that? Zombieland with what's yeah, his name? Actually... Uh, who's that guy? The guy that played Lex Luthor. Um, in the, I know who you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Jesse Eisenberg. So he was in Zombieland <laughs> with uh, with that Eisenberg kid. Um, he was in Kingpin, the bowling movie, with Randy Quaid and somebody else. Bill Murray. Yeah, Bill Murray. There you go. He was in that. And there's another yeah. another actor that came back in his later age with a lot of good movies, and that's Bill Murray. I mean, we loved yeah. him in Caddyshack, Ghostbusters, Stripes, you know, all the 70s and 80s movies that he was in. And then he kind of went away for a little while and then came back with Lost in Translation. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, Lost in Translation was one of my yeah. favorite movies that he's in. It also introduced me to Scarlett Johansson. Thank you. <laughs> Fair enough. But he did do other things. He was in Scrooge, he, and, and that was in the 90s, if I recall correctly. Um, Groundhog Day. You know, again, he was doing stuff, but not in a way that was different, if you will, from what he had been doing in the past. You know, one of the things that a friend of mine had remarked on about Bill Murray movies is at the end of the movie, he's the same guy. It's the people around him that have changed, that have gone on their journey to adapt to him as opposed to him adapting to the situation. And as he's gotten older, a lot of the movies that he's been in have been about him adapting uh, or his character. Interesting. Yeah, and, and that's why I think, again, that only knowing who two of the actors are in this movie is really cool because it does that thing where you don't have an expectation of what the character is going to be like. And yeah. it gives these actors a chance to be in a big budget movie and get some exposure. You know, but the thing with Andy Serkis, though, is like, even though you say that he's got a very impressive uh, record, I mean, do you think people really know him yet? I mean, is is his name a household name quite yet? Because, again, you know, most people don't really haven't really seen his face except in like the beginning of Return of the King and uh, Black Panther and Age of Ultron. Other than that, he doesn't really show up a whole lot of times. I think that he is a household name because of the motion capture stuff, not necessarily the acting. So I agree with you to a point, but you can walk up to a lot of people and say, hey, do you know who Andy Serkis is? Like, yeah, isn't he the guy that does all that motion capture stuff? Um, oh, maybe, because, you know. you know, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of people who aren't into it, they don't even know what motion capture is. <laughs> yeah, well, I talked to some people who saw Age of Ultron, and more specifically, of late, saw Black Panther because he's 
featured, I don't want to say heavily, but a lot more than he had been in the past. More more prominently. Yeah. Right. And when you point out that that's Andy Serkis, it's not a who's Andy Serkis. It's like, oh, that's what he looks like. So, you know, they know the name. They just don't know what he looks like because he's been doing yeah. CGI and crap. Granted. But. You know, the, the other thing I, I was uh, that's on my mind, I uh, just kind of go, going back to Woody Harrelson. You know, you were talking about there was at the time when he didn't do much. And I, I don't know exactly where that falls in the timeline. I just remember that my first experience, of course, with him was in Cheers that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, he p- basically played a buffoon. The next time I saw him was in the movie Natural Born Killers. And yeah. that was an interesting departure <laughs> from the, the sweet, innocent uh, Woody from Cheers to... Mickey Knox. <laughs> it was yes, serial killer extraordinaire. Definitely. That was, uh, I, I, you know, and I want, and it's a funny because I, I think about that, and I wonder if he channeled a little bit of that into this character in War of the Planet of the Apes. If a maybe the cold blooded killer, maybe because the thing that they talked about a lot when Natural Born Killers was a a thing, they talked about his violent past. I guess his father was a convicted murderer something of that nature so there was a lot of talk that he was able to channel that into his character interesting i did not know that yeah i I don't know this i forget the specifics of it but yeah he does come from a very violent past huh i wonder if that's why he takes some of these darker roles in the first place and more stylized roles such as like you said natural born killers the zombie land was a little more, I don't want to say stylized, but it was definitely a, a genre that one would not normally go see things in. Possibly. And a lot of times actors, uh, you know, they go with their strength. And the yeah. casting directors, you know, they see that. But then when he was in The Hunger Games, he was a grizzled veteran, if you will, of, of the games. And he was kind of the, the sage, older version that, understood the the nature of the beast of the games and i think that role fits him very well i think he fits that role because it's again if he's you know somebody who comes from a violent past obviously has the baggage that goes along with that you know whether or not you want to say it's the ptsd or the the scars however you want to classify it he's dead it's definitely something else that he can channel i was gonna say if you can tap into that and point it in the right direction to do the right thing yeah and i I think that's what makes him a very effective actor in that range yeah i mean he was just recently nominated for an oscar so i think he's doing you know a lot of the right stuff so oh yeah yeah Um, and he's going to be in the han solo a star wars or the solo a star wars movie Later the on, the solo year. solo feature. Yeah. Yes, the solo solo feature. <laughs> Which, by the way, I saw the trailer for that the other day, the the latest trailer, and I was very impressed. And uh, I am really looking forward to seeing Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian. I am looking forward to that. One of the things that I am a little concerned about is it looks a little strange, if you will, in the less Star Wars than I'm used to. I mean, Rogue One, I was excited for because it looked like more star wars this looks a little like it's a heist movie set in the star wars universe so i'm gonna go see it i'm hoping it's good that's what i'm kind of looking forward to actually because star wars is basically and i'm not saying this is a problem but focused on war you know it's the rebellion the empire this is going to be a little bit more of the you know this is what the rest of the world is doing while this war is going on and i kind of like that yeah, it's 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 a little a little sneak peek into a life as opposed to a, a movement and effort, if you will. Apparently, Woody's also going to be in Venom, which opens really? later this year. I did not know that. I didn't know that either. He's going to play an unnamed character, and apparently, Tom Holland is going to be in this mo- in Venom as well. Very nice. Which some motion capture in that too brings us right back to the War for the Planet of the Apes. Not the battle for the Planet of the Apes, which again, I know I mentioned that earlier, but had I had the time, I've been kind of busy this weekend, I was going to watch it and just provide like a side review. Um, From what I remember of it, though, it's steaming garbage. (laughs) But you know what? I'll probably buy it because it'll be part of the box set and you know what a completist I am. (laughs) (laughs) Watching these movies, you know, like I said, it may be wax nostalgic on the uh, old Planet of the Apes. And I thought, well, if I'm going to buy one, I might as well buy them all. Yes, and go all the way to the end. 
But regarding Battle for the Planet of the Apes, somebody still put love into that. They did the best they could because their budget was slashed. I mean, I've read some of the histories and stuff like that. They did the best they could with what they had, and they tried hard to make the best movie they could with what they had. And, not for nothing, it kept some people employed, you know, and was able to feed families and stuff. So, even though I might think it's a steaming pile of poo, there's still that nostalgic love for it so it's it's like a lot of movies that uh i know again i i repeat myself but i have some movies on my shelf that are great big piles of crap but i absolutely love them when they pop up on the list i will espouse my fandom you know you talking about that it made me think back a few years uh, i was living in santa cruz with my cousins uh they were living in family student housing at the uc santa cruz on campus uh, so I was privy to a lot of talks uh, where authors and screenwriters uh, were able to come on campus, talk to a group of students about the, their work. And I got to see, and I forget his first name, but Berman, he's a writer for Star Trek, for okay. the Star Trek television series. Uh, one of the questions posed to him, I mean, yeah, a lot of interesting Star Trek questions, but some are also for general writing. And, you know, somebody asked about, you know, it's like, how do you feel about people who make bad movies? And he had a very interesting answer, which is kind of along what you said. He's like, yeah, there, there are movies that you can judge as being bad, but you've got to stand in awe that it got made at all. It, you know, like you said, it's somebody's love project. Somebody went through the trouble to get it funded, to get it greenlit, and to get it made. So even though we can stare at it and say this quality is poor, it's still amazing to him that any movie gets made. And he, he judged it based on that. And I thought that was a very interesting answer for that. It just, you, yeah, you reminded no, me of agree. that by saying I agree. that. The fact that any movie gets made is pretty impressive. I, I, again, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but the podcast, uh, How Did This Get Made? It's three actors, two of which are married. They're uh, actor and actress. But they will discuss horrible movies. And, you know, just poke fun at them. But even they respect and appreciate the fact that somebody had a vision. Somebody wanted to make this movie. Somebody made this into a thing. You know, the fact that they're making fun of it. If it didn't exist, then they couldn't make fun of it. So it just continues that circle of life. <laughs> yeah. This is by far the worst movie I have ever seen. Yes, ah, but, you but you did go see it. seen it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, so I, I do care for that. That was a free plug for the How Did This Get Made podcast. You're welcome. <laughs> it, call me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's a good one. I, I was kind of staring at the computer while I was talking about that other podcast, and I remember that you had mentioned Nova prior to the break. and yes. the character Nova. The character Nova and Maurice as the name of the actor that played Dr. Zaius, and one of the things that was also in this movie was the birth, or rather the showing, of Caesar's youngest son, Cornelius, which, again, that's a tip of the hat to the previous franchise, and Cornelius, who was the ape that came back in time, and actually started the ape revolution in the original Planet of the Apes franchise movies. So I thought that was a nice tip of the hat, and it did make me wonder, again, if these were the characters growing up or their ancestors. It will be interesting to see exactly, you know, where, if these are just, like you said, tips of the hat, or these actual premonitions for movies to come. Really, I honestly hope they are premonitions, because I would like to see them take this further and... Again, you know, like we said, our, our joy in finding continuity. Yes. Like I said, the concept that I had spoke of earlier, you know, where the astronauts show back up on Earth and wondering, you know, what, what the hell happened here? Is, is this Earth or are we on a different planet and where Cornelius and Nova are the, the good guys that they have to band with to survive versus the other band of apes who don't like humans all that much? Yeah, and, and that could be an interesting civil war of the planet of the apes or something like that. <laughs> That, that would be interesting. Or if the nerds really take over, debate over the planet of the apes. <laughs> <laughs> Notion is carried that the humans will be... 
but that goes back to what we talked about earlier about whether or not the rest of the apes on the planet were suddenly becoming smart, if they had contracted the simian flu as well. If this being a global epidemic which affected the entire human population of the world, then I would assume that the apes would also be affected. Maybe not so much the ones living in the wild, who don't have as much exposure to humans. And and that's where I was going to go was, what about them? Because they would stay on their normal evolutionary trajectory unless they came into contact. If it's an airborne virus, which I believe it was, that yeah. was something that they mentioned because it traveled on airplanes and got throughout the populated human world, which would mean that theoretically all the apes and everything that was in the human world would be affected. So there must be a pocket of apes that are not affected by the simian flu. So you've got your smart apes and your dumb apes. Now, that'd be an interesting... Uh... Thing to explore in subsequent movies is you know how the smart apes will treat the wild apes yeah would they take care of them and treat them as their you know dumb cousins i guess or as the theme of from the second movie you know i thought just because he was ape that he would be good but koba was not good you know he was bad you know as to where you'll start to see the smart apes treating the wild apes as poorly as humans treated them before yeah that could be a story worth exploring or they maybe they treat them like disabled. Because obviously if they run into them, then they've already got the simian flu and they would be exposing them to it. But the other aspect of this is the simian flu killed, what, 90% of the Earth's population of humans? Yeah. The other 10% either had some sort of immunity to it or got a slightly less uh, effective version, I guess. You know, they were able to combat it, so they have an immunity. Now, that would the, the disease evolving and turning them into mutes, basically taking them down the evolutionary scale, that's, that's fine. But again, that disease would have to continue to mutate because I'm, I'm no geneticist, I'm no virologist, but if you have 10% of the human population that was immune, then that would, I suppose potentially imply that 10% of the ape population would be immune as well. So even the pockets of apes that were not in Is contact isolated. with them, yeah, you would still have 10% of the exposed apes that would not be affected, I would think, ish. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing here because based yeah. off the numbers that the movie presents. It uh, definitely brings up some interesting explorations, you know. It's just, to, again, to that this movie series did a very good job of doing was exploring a lot of the social issues of how to treat others and everything and so what you're talking about would be an interesting foundation for exploring those behaviors even further you know because again it's like yeah the 10 percent that aren't affected how will they be treated our apes who are supposedly now you know they're relatively new to the whole intelligence and and emotions and everything you know how are they going to react to apes that aren't as intelligent as they are I'd love to see that explored. I'd, I'd love to see that in subsequent movies. And and one last thing before I move past the genetic manipulation or the changing of the disease or evolution of the disease. If the simian flu mutated to change its effect on humans, what did that mutation do to the apes that were exposed? Because it's the same virus. It would have some sort of different effect on them as well, right? Theoretically, again. Maybe, uh, again, to the whole continuity thing, maybe it'll uh, affect them physically, and that's why they'll start to, you'll start to see apes that stand more upright and actually look more human in stature. Yeah, and explain why they start to wear clothes. Possibly. Because Bad Ape is the first one to start wearing clothes in all of the movies, if I recall correctly. In at least the reboot movies, none, Caesar doesn't wear clothes. No, none of them do, actually, I think. Yeah, I think uh, Bad Ape, he he did so, it seemed, out of necessity, though, because he lived in a very cold environment, so he wanted to stay warm, and he was smart enough to know, put a jacket on and you get warm. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And he uh, he also seemed very hairless. He didn't seem to have a lot of hair. I mean, that could no, just be me, so. maybe. And the reason I bring all of that up with the mutations of the disease and all that kind of stuff is it gives them... A whole lot more to explore and yet still tie it to the original franchise 
and what happened in those intervening years because we still don't know if it was 15 years or a thousand years. I'm tending to lean more towards a thousand years just because, well, maybe not a thousand, but a, a, a longer period of time because all of the apes in the original franchise, as I said earlier, were wearing clothes. They were researching things. They had built a civilization, edifices that had been around for some time. And mm-hmm. in the follow-on movies, they have the, like, beneath the Planet of the Apes where they had the worship of the bomb and all that kind of thing. That stuff takes time to sort of evolve or devolve into. So I would lean more towards a few hundred years at the very least as opposed to uh, Cornelius being the Cornelius from the original franchise and Nova being the Nova from the original franchise. Yeah, that'd be interesting. You know, again, Descendants. It's a thing. You, you know, you're talking about, you know, the future of this and, you know, go, kind of going back to emulating the original uh, Planet of the Apes where the apes pretty much dominated and humans were considered wild animals because they couldn't talk. But, you know, this is the thing that this franchise has that the other did not was where the apes communicate via sign language. And they're able to communicate now with the mute humans who most of them, I, I would imagine, retain the ability to think, if not the ability to speak. They're teaching them sign language. So that's why I'm thinking that, you know, further down the line, at least this group of apes will have a better relationship with humans. Again, if this flows into the original franchise, the dominant train of thought amongst the apes was that humans were dumb, that they were useless except as, we'll call it slave labor. I mean, they were no better than than the horses that they rode. You know, they couldn't be taught. It was only a small few scientists that were willing to explore the possibility that humans could do more than just what they'd thought or what the dominant line, line of thinking was. So, again, that lends credence to my theory, I think, anyway, that it was at least several hundred years between the end of this movie and the old franchise. Yeah. Well, again, you know, only time will tell, and hopefully we get some good writers to give us a good story. And that's the key. Just tell me a good story. I can forgive little plot holes here and there or little inconsistencies in continuity because it could be an alternate timeline. Who knows? You know, in much the same way as the Mark Wahlberg, Tim Burton, Planet of the Apes, he went out and then he came back and he was in a different world. So I don't even know. Is that, from the continuity standpoint, is that one even really a part of these grander movies or is that just an outlier? Do you know? I think that's just not like I don't think it has anything to do with this franchise. I think he he attempted to create his own storyline and it just uh, it didn't do so well at the box office and just ended there. Yeah, I still watch it when it's on. Oh yeah, no, there's there's certain aspects of it that I enjoy. I, the actors in it, um, Tim Roth's character, Michael Clark Duncan. Yes, you know, those are all, those Rest are all good peace. actors. And uh, Hel- Helena Bonham Carter was actually a very attractive ape. So. <laughs> feel kind of weird saying that but yes i agree so there's that yeah so i think i've covered everything i wanted to talk about i, I really hadn't actually made any notes about that genetic mutation thing so that was yeah. the, off the cuff it's kind of on the fly yeah i mean you know i mean there's, there's there's probably you know lots of other things that we can look at on on this you know i mean again that spans across the three movies i do like caesar's growth yes in this and then actually you know in this movie it wasn't so much his growth because i mean he had he had already grown into a pretty good leader. He still had uh, compassion. You know, he spared the soldiers in the beginning. You know, it's like, what's what's your message? It's like, they are my message. He had reached the top of his game at the beginning of this movie. I think what we showed here is that, you know, he had a fall from grace because then he had like the whole vengeance thing. And Maurice pointed out, it's like, now you're like Koba. You can't let go of your hate. But there was a difference there, at least in my mind. He was directing it in a way that was actually helping his people. Again, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but when he set himself up to be the decoy, it was to let his people escape. Yes, he wanted to do the thing. He wanted to kill the colonel for killing his family. But he was also recognizing that if he moved this way, that could be a feint, and the rest of the ape population 
could try and get away. Mm-hmm. So had he stayed with with the group, he would have been captured immediately, and we would have had a totally different movie. Yeah, true. But, you know, I, I did like his bit near the end when he goes up to exact his revenge on the colonel and discovers that the colonel has contracted the virus and he is more primitive and mute and he doesn't kill him. He could have. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm reading that wrong because it is entirely possible that that was Caesar seeing the poetic justice and going, yeah, no, I'm not letting you off that easy. Now you have to suffer. But... You know, he did leave him the gun, and he did give him the opportunity to commit suicide, which he, he did. And I thought that was an interesting point in the story from a character development piece. It, there's obviously a couple of different ways you can interpret it. I choose to believe that he was... he. I choose to believe that Caesar chose not to give in to his darker side, to his, his taste for vengeance after his flashbacks to Koba and wanted to differentiate himself from the ape that he did not care for, if you will. Well said. I like that. Yeah. You know, like I said, I mean, you know, Caesar is just, he's one of those more memorable characters that I think that, you know, he, for not to play on words here and everything, but he his, his is a character that has evolved very well over the last three movies. <laughs> <laughs> Pun recognized, and there's really no way to skirt it. He evolved. He evolved. Yeah. He, he grew. It's very refreshing to see characters like that grow. You know, there's certain characters that you see in movies, and it's just like, yeah, so so what? He didn't grow. He didn't learn. He didn't develop or anything. You know, it's like... Yeah, like a lot of Bill Murray's earlier characters, like we talked about earlier. Like, yeah, everybody else changed around you, and you just traveled through a storm. Good job. Yeah. I do like the... I, I guess I'm kind of bringing it back full circle to the allegorical pieces of this movie because the apes can represent any, we'll call it marginalized people, uh, any people that are taken advantage of. Now, the, the slave labor thing obviously evokes African American, but the oppression of any peoples could be represented. So it gives the viewer something to identify with in that aspect. It also gives the the viewer, it gives us, the opportunity to kind of experience that emotional journey to wanting to be free, to cast off, you know, the oppression and just go live free the way you want to. I mean, there's a certain side of that that is appealing. There's a lot to unpack, if you don't mind my use of the current popular phrase for discussing things. When you look at this movie, there are a lot of little subtexts and ideas that are more than just the monkeys want to get to a new home and be safe. Apes, sorry. <laughs> to my sentient ape listeners, I apologize and I will continue to evolve. He's learning. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. What do you think? Yeah. Again, I say this often about sci-fi movies in general and especially this one you know it's like they, they've always been able to as long as they remain subtle and don't overstate their intents you know it's always been able to show us a good commentary on on the social conditions of today by showing us how they would be in the future and they dress it up just enough to where it's like well that's not really us but wow that is like us and it's like no that's exactly you you know <laughs> yeah it makes it relatable yeah, the, and it's been a very good catalyst for opening discussions and relating to uh, these movies are, are a great way to, to talk about those issues without being preachy and driving a stake into somebody's head, you know. It's... Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's interesting you say that because I recall specifically, and I may have mentioned this before on the podcast, but I recall a conversation that I had actually with your father many, many moons ago. I think your father was in the hospital. And you and I had gone to visit him. I think we were going up to your cousin's place in Santa Cruz to go see a movie or something, which is why I was in town. But you wanted to go see your dad, you know, before we went wherever we were going to go. Um, and I was talking to your dad, and he had asked me what types of books I read. Because if I recall correctly, your dad read 
westerns, Louis L'Amour, that sort of thing. Uh, actually, more more he was more of a history buff. Uh, he knew who Louis L'Amour was, but he wasn't really into fiction. He said history was way more interesting. Okay. So he would he would actually chastise me for reading fiction because he felt that's just a bunch of hooey. Why don't you read some real stuff? Right. And, well, during our conversation, though, he had asked me what type of books I read, and I told him that I had read science fiction and that I also read comic books and, you know, a lot of things that, again, he, he frowned upon. At least that was the sense that I got, and it confirmed later through you. But he asked me why I read these things, and I told him the exact same thing that uh, that you just said, which is basically it gives me a window into the human heart through the lens of the future so I see what we can become or I see what we are and I just have a different way to look at it. It's all human stories. They're all telling us who we are and who we can be. What matters or what is different rather is the setting. So uh, and, and I remember specifically this uh, because you were frustrated when we were walking out to your car uh, that you had said the exact same thing to your father uh, on, on a number of occasions. And, mm -hmm. and, and you were, I, I believe vexed is a, is a gentle word for saying how you felt. Uh, you were extremely yeah. frustrating. And, uh, and, and, and I just want to say, I, I know this has been some time, and I'm not trying to, you know, open old wounds or anything like that, um, but I will say to you the exact same thing that I said then. Sometimes it's not what is said, but who says it, and because he was so close to you and he had such expectations for you to do a thing that he didn't want to hear it from you, but he was more receptive to it when it came from somewhere else, and that probably helped him understand you a little bit better. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I know that's that's kind of a weird weird backstory, but uh, this goes to what we were talking about. How this movie specifically it allows us to look at ourselves as humans, and we get a better lesson of what it means to be human from an ape, and even preacher, the crossbow guy, you know, who was let go. He was allowed to return turns out to be a crappy human because they didn't follow the standard movie trope of letting him get Caesar in his sights and then not shooting and letting him go. You know, he takes the shot and, and he actually takes the killing shot because that's what killed Caesar eventually, as we discussed earlier, is is mm -hmm. the crossbow arrow. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, he's going to let him go. And then he shoots him. You're like, oh, crap, what a jackass. What a dick. <laughs> you know, because, you know, by that point in the movie, you're rooting for Caesar and, and his apes to survive uh, and get out of the middle of the conflict between the two groups of humans. And we never really see the other group of humans aside from they exist, they're shooting weapons, uh, but we don't know what their motivation is. We don't know why they really want to do anything. It's just stop being so apart from us. Stop being an ass clown. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they ever explore what you know who those other people were. And again, so much open in this world. The possibilities are endless. Yes. And then a meteor hits the world, everybody dies, and they're like, "Oh, I uh, guess that ended." <laughs> like, you know, so much for the, the next movie's happened. like five minutes long. It's Armageddon, and they just can't go into space. Son of a bitch! <laughs> All right. Well, I think I've wrapped up about everything that. Uh... I had to say, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I think, you know, I think I spoke about everything I intended to about this. It was, like I said, it was just a, it was a surprise to me that this was such a great franchise. It, you know, because again, we started out thinking that this was going to be just another bad knockoff. And uh, it ended up being really great. It was, thank you to the makers. Yeah, I think the trilogy, the Rise, Dawn, and War movies... Uh, actually got better with every iteration. And I think that's uh, something you don't see very often. Because Rise of the Planet of the Apes, the James Franco, John Lithgow movie, it was all right. It was, it was okay. Um, but 
This movie, War for the Planet of the Apes, was several steps above it in quality of story, in movie making, in the CGI. Um, I, I just think it was a better all-around movie. Okay, I think that actually covers up my final thoughts. Uh, where would you put this on your shelf? Uh, this one goes in that... I don't know if I mentioned it before that, you know, there's that special shelf of, of Blu-rays or anything where franchises, you know, you get the this little section of superheroes, section of Star Wars. It, it's it's up on that as, as as notable series. Not quite top shelf, but not quite general population. Oh, so it's it, above general population. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely it's definitely a franchise that I enjoy. Which, you know, part of the, the final thought is that it's also a franchise that my wife uh likes mutually with me. She she really enjoyed nice. the series or anything. We watched them. We watched all of them together. It's relatively rare for her to like a movie that I like. I say relatively rare because you know she likes a lot of the Marvel movies as well and everything like that. But and she likes Star Wars even though she had never seen it before me. But you know the list is finite. I watched this with Christy and she hadn't seen it before either, and she seemed to be okay with the movie. I don't know if she liked it as much as I did. We shared some thoughts and ideas, particularly the watch standing thing, because I, <laughs> it's like, what the? <laughs> well, um, that's definitely something you two can relate to. Yes, but the overall sense was that she liked it. Now, me personally, I thought it was, like I said earlier, great. Uh, if I owned this, and I will probably go pick this up, um, it would go above general population. Probably, let's say, back of the second shelf. I think I've got a couple of movies there already um, that we've already reviewed. It's really good. I really enjoyed it. I have some top shelf movies that kind of push it down. So um, it's a good, solid movie that's out of general population. Shall we move on to the next movie? Let's do so. And here we go. Seven. Oh. Did you hear that? Yeah. So, seven. Okay. I'm really excited to do this movie. I know we've had some conversations on our Facebook page about this, and I look forward to having those conversations quasi face-to-face, you know, because we do this on a video call to our listeners, as we've mentioned before. I will solicit inputs from our listeners, on the Facebook page, uh, I would like to get some conversation, you know, some comments beforehand, uh, something that we haven't necessarily done before, um, and and I'd like to see how that goes. So I'm excited. Uh, this is a movie that we will have fun talking about. I don't want to spoil how I feel about it and where it will eventually, where it would belong on my shelf. How about you? I'm excited to talk about this. I, this is a movie I've uh, I've loved for a very long time for a lot of different reasons, so it'd be interesting to talk about it. All right, cool. So uh, to our listeners, you can contact us by email at wrios2016mr at gmail.com. <laughs> or you can leave some feedback on our Facebook page, which, again, is we'll review it our shelves. Uh, you can also leave feedback on the Podbean page, on the YouTube page. You can leave us reviews on the iTunes or the Google Play. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Again, I implore you, uh, if you want to send some audio uh, for playing, for playing, that we'll play, rather, on an episode, feel free to email us an audio file, and we'll get that uploaded and put it into uh, the episode under the listener comments. Um, and yeah, we hope to hear from you soon. Dan, do you have a specific movie theme to goodbye for us this episode? Oh, I'm sorry. This was Planet of the Apes. It was in sign language, so goodbye. (laughs) Well played. Uh, Thanks, and we'll see you in two weeks with seven. Bye-bye.